just by way of comment before I begin the sermon, I know in our culture the uh, understanding and the experience to become wealthy, to become rich, you know that phrase, to have freedom at age 55 is front and center of people growing up in Canada and throughout North America. But again, the word that we hear today reminds us that it isn't the accumulation of wealth that makes you rich. It is knowing the graciousness of the Father through Jesus. And so again, uh, if there's any person here today who does not know that, is not confident in that relationship with Jesus, I encourage you, take the time during the service or after the service to come to ask the Lord to make him your wealth, your pearl of great price, so that today, if that hour comes when the Lord calls you home, for Jesus' sake, you are welcomed into heaven because of that. The text is taken, the sermon is taken from the second reading where Paul has wrote those words, devote yourselves to prayer. Let us pray. You are present, Lord Jesus, through the word and through the prayers, you are present in our lives. Your heart's desire is that all who are drawn close to you not only know you and understand you, but have this relationship of love and grace in them. But you continue to speak to your disciples, your followers, calling them into a posture of prayer. Help us here at Grace to be that church community, to be a Christian community that obeys you and learns from you how to pray. For I ask this in your name. Amen. Whoever you are, when you open up the Bible, but particularly the New Testament, and you do a, just a, an initial reading from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, which we call the Gospels, and they center on the person of Jesus, one of the things that catches your eye about Jesus, even if you're not a believer in Him or a follower in Him, one of the things that really grabs your attention is that Jesus is a person who prays. He's not unaccustomed to look up to heaven with hands raised forward and say, Gracious God, Gracious Father, hear me as I come to you in prayer. You can't get away from it. From the very beginning of his life to the very end of his life and even today as he sits at the right hand of the Father, if there's one ministry, one work that Jesus has done and is still doing, it's this, he is praying for you. From the moment of his conception, his mother, Mary, joined her family and her fiancé in praying, Lord, bless this union that we shall have. Bless it with a child. And, you know, Mary received that miraculous conception through the working of the Holy Spirit and Jesus was born because of a prayer request. Lord, send to me a child. In conception, from conception, a child was born who we know was Jesus. And as he grew in years, especially I think at the time when he was at his, uh, with his parents visiting the temple, he reminded them that I am in my father's house doing my father's will, which was to be a person of prayer. Later on, I recall, he, you know, admonishes a lot of people. My father's house is not a place where it's active doing the thieves business, but it is a place that is dedicated and devoted to pray for prayer. And then at age 30 when he leaves his work as a carpenter and begins his work as a preacher and a teacher and someone who heals people throughout from beginning to end in this three year period everything that he did he did as a result 
of prayer. Recall with me, when he knew that he needed workers to help him go forth, it says he spent the whole night in prayer. And then in the morning he came and he saw Simon and Andrew. And he called James and John and Matthew. He called them to be his disciples, but it emerged from a posture of prayer. And when he did his miracles, whether it was raising the widow's son at Nain to changing water into the wine, you know, or cleansing people from powers greater than themselves, every single one of them is the result of Jesus who prays for them. I think of especially the girl Tabitha. You know, he, he anoints her with spittle. He looks up to heaven and he prays to the Father and brings healing to this young girl. Even at the Lord's Supper, the Lord's, uh, he took time and he gave thanks to the Father. He broke this bread and he said, take and eat. Then he took the wine, he gave thanks to the Father, and then he said, take and drink. And yes, lest we forget, even in his last hours, while hanging on the cross, although we may know them as the seven last words that Jesus spoke, many a person within Christian tradition have actually called these the seven last prayer petitions of Jesus on life especially the most notable the one where he says father forgive them for they know not what they're doing and his prayer for our forgiveness is answered and even today as he ascended to the right hand of the father there's two verses that catch my heart and catch my attention one is from Romans chapter 8 verse 34 that says, who will condemn you, O Christian? Who is the one that points the finger at you and says, you are not worthy to enter into heaven. You are not worthy because of, and then they will mention a sin or a series of sins. And then Paul writes, no one will condemn you, O Christian, because Christ Jesus is at the right hand of God and right now he's praying for you. You know, he's praying for you. I don't know how to pray, but thanks be to Jesus that he's praying for you. Non-stop, 24-7. And the Father hears his son's prayer on my behalf. And then Hebrews 7, verse 25. Therefore Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him and then please note because Jesus always is alive praying the word there is interceding for you you know I'll, I'll admit before I'm not a 24-hour prayer person I would love to be but oftentimes my mind and my heart is filled with the concerns of my family, my children, my work, you know. I remember you in prayer, but it's not 24-7. There are times where I struggle with this whole ministry. But what I am grateful for as a brother in Christ, and what I am grateful for as a pastor to you, is to turn you to this guy right here, the shepherd. He is praying for you. It is his prayers for you that save you. And to give thanks to God, our Father, for Jesus. For what a wonderful work that is among us and in us. This is Jesus' way of life. You know, he began, he, he continued, and he continues still to be a person alive, steeped, praying for us. I draw this to our attention because now it should come as no surprise 
to us who read and hear Paul's writing when he says these words to Christians living in Colossae, a city along the um, Aegean Sea, and then by extension to us here at Grace, where he says these words, devote yourself to prayer. This morning we were looking at the Bible study, uh, Alan's text was, continue steadfastly in prayer. In the Greek language, the word there is, make sure that you're like a, a, a plod horse, a workhorse that's got blinders on yourself so that you neither move to the left nor move to the right, but you have this single-minded focus that the only thing that needs uh, to be done is this, that you are committed to prayer. That's what Paul is saying to Christians living in Colossae. Be intentional. Be intentional in being a person, a community that prays. And what do you pray for? Paul points out that doors will be opened to tell another person about Jesus. That Paul himself will be an effective communicator about Jesus to people's lives. And that workers Yes, workers are still needed to go forward to do the work of Jesus in community. And Paul now lists ten of them, starting with, I can't even say his name, he did so well there, Rene, uh, Tychius or Tychus, Onesmius, Luke, and then he ends with a guy named Archippus. A part of me would like to say, I sure wish it was Matthew and John and Greg, you know, and and, and uh, um, I'm going to say Chris, my wife's Chris, you know. Names that I'm familiar with. But if we need workers, if work is needing to be done here in this community, we will not use force, we will not manipulate. But one of the things, the only thing that we will do is we will pray. Lord, we need workers in your kingdom. Raise them up. The fields are white unto harvest. And Jesus said, and Paul caught it, ask the Lord to send workers into his field. So this morning when you've come to Grace Lutheran, and in just a few minutes you will be leaving back into your community, wherever that may be, what is that word that you've heard this morning Jesus speaking to you about? It is this. Devote yourselves to prayer. Now, I do want to end right now. A big part of me would like to end right now. But before I do, I want to draw your attention to that area though that is a great ache in the midst of Christian faith, particularly the Lutheran family here in North America, in Canada, in Camrose. We're not great prayer warriors. You know, let us before God be honest. As much as we would love to be prayerful and be more concerted in our praying, the fact of the matter is, is that generally speaking, we seldom take the time to pray. 10 minutes a day? 20 minutes a day, you know, 30 minutes a day. Historically in the office of the pastor where we emerged out of a Roman Catholic setting, the pastor was to pray seven times a day. They were called the offices. You know, early in the morning, long before most people arose, the clergy in community gathered for prayer. And then, as the day progressed throughout the day, at seven designated times, the pastor would be either in the office or with other clergy praying for his flock. And then at the very end of the day, Compline's investors, a prayer service. You know, 
I have long uh, traveled away from that. You know, in my training, in my schooling, in my disciplining, you know, setting time for prayer. No, I'd rather be doing this and that for you. You know, showing myself to be a more actively geared clergy. But the greatest work that I offer on behalf of the Lord for you, and the greatest work that we can offer to one another is a ministry of prayer. It does work. The Lord has promised that he will honor his name as we go forward to do his work. And it begins and it continues and it starts by being prayerful. So today, for those of you who continue to journey here at Grace or seek to journey here at Grace I am confident that you will see in the months ahead that we are evolving into a, a, a community that is willing to pray for people not only during this service celebration but throughout the week if anyone is sick amongst you Call an elder who will come and pray for you. If anyone needs to know the Lord, you know, your son or daughter, your husband, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, is at a distance from the Lord, we will speak about that person in prayer. And let the Holy Spirit come and touch your heart. Let the Holy Spirit come and renew your mind. Let the Holy Spirit come and bring you to Jesus. We will be, because the Lord desires this, a community that is quick to pray. A community that is returning to its proper place, devoted to prayer. Amen.